All right, hello everyone. This is Dr. Joel Rosen. The last time I had my special guest on here, I called myself the Adrenal Fatigue Recovery Ninja, but now I call myself the Stress Fatigue Recovery Ninja. And so anyways, I'm here with a special guest, Alessandro Ferretti. Uh, Alessandro was here about a year and a half ago, um, and now we're going to get an update. But just to tell you a little bit about Alessandro, he loves to lecture. He lectures all across UK and US. Um, he does a lot of research with uh, adaptive keto diets and, and, and revision, revising nutritional principles. And lastly, he's a, a performer of his own life and tracking and, and really making a difference in this field. So it's my special honor to uh, introduce my special guest, Alessandro Ferretti. How are you doing, Alessandro? Thank you for joining us. Hi. Uh, thanks. You know, thank you for having me again. Um, and uh, yeah, very great pleasure to be here. Well, great. So, so Alessandro, I, I, I listened to our, our interview that we did about a year and a half ago, and, uh, and I still get information from it. And so one of the things that you said was the hairs on the back of your neck stick up when someone asks you about the definition of adrenal fatigue. Um, because you're a scientist and you understand all the mechanisms that go into, uh, into balancing the stress response. And, and your definition was really great. You said it was a conglomerate, a conglomerate of different metabolic pathways that aren't working symbiotically. And I thought that was great. And, and you also mentioned, too, that when you had talk, heard Dr. Kerry Jones, who we've had on a couple times as well, talk about the HPA axis response. And it was like you were a kid in a candy shop when you heard her talk. And I feel the same way when I hear you talk. So um, why don't you give us a little <laughs> update on uh, what's happened since the last time we talked and where you just mentioned to me your research is going towards in the chronobiology uh, world. Wow, yeah, sure. Um, so the, I think, uh, okay, first of all, I'm just a simple uh, nutritionist that loves research. And uh, I, I guess the, um, I, I love to see what science does. And I still think that we need some real uh, context um, in the applications because sometimes the cohorts that scient scientists would choose may not reflect the people that a specific group can be like. So, and in, in, in this is when we sometimes find differences between what the science says and the actual real application for a specific subset of population. Um, so, especially being a nutritionist, I've, you know, I was taught the what about the diet, but the, the, there wasn't hardly any uh, attention on the how I eat, I don't know, don't eat when you're stressed kind of thing, uh, whatever that means, and or the when. And so mm, now we know that, for example, food tends to regulate uh, peripheral oscillator clocks, and these could be responsible for a certain type of detoxification and treatment. So, so it, it's it's a lot more complex. And as I mentioned last time, um, the uh, hyper arousal of HPA axis is 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 to a certain extent is quite individual. Hence, I call it a HPA axis. So, is the amygdala um, hypothalamus pituitary axis. So, um, I didn't want to sound obnoxious by, by saying that one of the words of, you know, adrenal fatigue is, 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 is one of my pet hate kind of thing is because there are so many things that when, when a certain degree of life load to certain extent, good or bad, um, is elevated, then the body is trying to compensate in whichever way it can in order to take this into consideration. And if we look at the triad of the nervous uh, endocrine immune system, it's not just an endocrine problem, is it? So immunity, immunity is affected, the, the nervous system is affected, the endocrine system is affected, and consequently, uh, gut and everything else. So I can see that sometimes people saying, oh, my 
a HPA accent. The reason why I put amygdala, by the way, is because it's a personal, at the end of the day, it, it's a personal interpretation of the stress. Um, if I have something really bad to happening to me, you may be empathic towards me, but you're not going to feel the same impact as I have on something that is really bad for me. And, 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 and this is particularly important, uh, especially when people seem to be affected by things that normally they would be able to deal with very well, but the accumulations of many of these things leads them to a heightened stress response. So, which is the reason why I also call it life load, because at the end of the day, the more are the things that we need to do in a day and think about in a day and, and, and uh, deal with things happening around us, the higher is the load, which I really like that definition. So higher life load. When, when, when I'm lecturing away uh, or when I'm researching, I'm still doing all stuff that I love doing, but it's still a load that I have to account for. So and this is what I think the tracking comes uh, in, you know, in, in place, uh, allowing that what we are tracking is actually, is actually useful. So um, if we deconstruct that kind of AHPA activation, um, we see that there is a perceptory element. Um, we now know that um, sleep and, and, and poor sleep, uh, short sleep, low quality sleep seems to affect negatively our perception of what's happening around us. So um, there is a lovely book from Professor Matthew Walker um, called Why We Sleep. It goes into uh, the science of it and some of the details and it's brilliant. It's still a book that can be read by anyone. So you don't have to have any medical knowledge or scientific knowledge on, on the matter. But I think it's great because he actually shows how our cognition tends to be affected by as a reduct activity, um, whereas our amygdala is heightened when we have sleep problems. So it means that we can get stressed perhaps faster or for longer or we don't tell to deal with things, our uh, propensity to risk taking increases. Our food behavior, as far as selection of the type of foods we have, tends to change. So it, it's very, very complex onto, onto that. And I think, as I mentioned in the first one, I, I always try to understand to my best ability uh, when I cannot measure um, ACTH, if it's the stress response coming to the brain and then not going down or going down and then the adrenals are not working well. And this is quite difficult as I think Dr. Carrie Jones has highlighted um, in, in, in one of her podcasts. I'm not sure if it's, she's done it with you, uh, but unless you measure that hormone, then it may just be the fact that, you know, the brain is starting to not send the messages through. Uh, in which case the adrenal, uh, I don't think adrenal is the subject anymore. So it's not that the adrenals are fatigued, it is the fact that the brain is starting to pull the oars into the ball, into the boat, and not really allowing the adrenals to into this hyperdrive. Um, so th that's the reason why I, I, I like the definition of AHPA dysfunction, um, which would involve adrenal perhaps in most of cases, but I don't think we can just say bluntly like that. So th that's one of the things. And the other things that I looked at is uh, a more of a low grade continuous um, activation. Um, it's interesting. I was having a couple of, um, <laughs> a couple of chats with um, immunologists and, and researchers and, and, a, and a colleague um, in that area where, where we find that uh, many times um, a, a, a more chronic low-grade uh, degree of inflammatory response, one is the one that we cannot see very well, and it just keeps idling in the background. 
um, that is the drain on our resources, both nutritional resources and as far as nutrients and as far as pathway upregulation, but also as far as effect, um, because the body is doing something uh, with that. And this is where we think there could potentially be a very strong connection between increased glucose level and um, and the reason why I started to research that was primarily because if we, if, if you see people on a low carbohydrate diet and inflammatory response is present, given the many, most, some scientists claim all of the immunological responses are mainly glycolytic, then we start to see an increase in, in, in glucose going around, which is either increase going around or we become more insulin resistant. And these are both plausible effects to have. Um, so clearly carbohydrate is not the only problem. Insulin resistance may not be the only problem. Um, and because I keep seeing people that are on a decent diet, low carbohydrate, I'm not saying that low carbohydrate is the decent diet, I'm saying the, the two different things. Um, um, and yet we see a fasting glucose that is elevated despite the carbs are not in that. So in, in addition to that, I actually saw a slight increase in, in, in certain individuals um, that were chronically inflamed on a low carbohydrate diet, on slightly um, hypocaloric diet, and still expressed the signs of fatigue and the signs of um, unwellness, brain fog, with an increased fasting glucose and a, and a decreased um, um, uh, heart rate variability. So, so you can see that that, that it, it will involve a bit. It, I think is a little bit overly simplistic when when a you know when, when we define that as you know just adrenal fatigue because I said okay. Is it mitochondrial? Is it just HPA axis activation or hyperarousal or just a simple stress response of inflammatory low grade type? Yeah, so so a lot going on there. So so to 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 understand uh, a little more of uh, what you're saying is uh, first of all um, the the term adrenal fatigue is is far too simplistic for what's going on in the body. Um, we have um, yeah. a perception which which is is above the the HPA axis in a sense um, from our old limbic centers in our brain that uh, keep us to survive and and almost tape record the event so that it it it, it, it plasticizes a, 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 or makes a a, a, a a sympathetic response um, that now we're looking at the circadian rhythm and the aspects of sleep where it makes that uh, perceived life load a, a lot more heightened um, when, when you have lack of circadian balance, which means that you could have um, depletion at a higher rate of your raw materials and then have a, a energy supply and demand problem. The, the other thing you were mentioning too was um, in terms of uh, energy production, and, and this is what you were talking about last time too, is you had a couple of, uh, uh, sub, um, I guess, conjectures of when the neuroendocrine system is more involved or is it more of a chronic inflammation cell danger, which you were mentioning just now as, is it from the yeah. head down or is it from inside the body already? So, um, so then that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Both ways. Yeah, both, both ways. ways at the same time. Yeah. Right, at the same time. So, okay, and, and I even believe too, Alessandro, that it even goes deeper than that as well, because now you're talking about microbiome and its ability to convert yeah. hormones and remove liver detox, um, you know, cell membranes. Uh, ability to bind receptors. I mean, it just goes so much deeper than even what we had anticipated yeah. as well. So, so okay, so if I'm the adrenally or, or the exhausted person that feels that my stress response is broken, last time you gave some really great advice in terms of, listen, 
if it when you eat food does it look like food as you would find it in nature and, and that was a really yeah. simple yeah. concept for for people to walk yeah. away with, right so um from there you talked about just clean it up and then we could start talking about more of the uh specific things that we can do and your research now which you're you're lecturing on is the the five basics in terms of diet physical activity sleep uh life load and i guess an inflammatory response so tell us what you've learned now going forward with that uh some of the some of the correlations that you're seeing even if it's not specific for everyone you're seeing some correlations that are inherent for for the majority yeah um yeah sure so uh i had been interested in looking at the effect on of on the environment and um, and i tend to group uh someone's life in in, on a physiolog physiological side, not on a psycho-emotional um, uh, side. So we have a diet, we have our physical activity, not necessarily exercise, but you know, physical activity, including uh, exercise perhaps. Um, then we have our life load. So the kind of balance that there is between our life load um, then we have the sleep and then we have the, our chronobiology. So these are the five main areas. And what, what, what we tried to do a little while ago and still may be able to do it, but the setup of this research project study is actually quite complex because what we wanted to do, uh, my idea was that if we give, if we consider a certain amount of motivation that people have, how would it be best for them to invest it? I, I, always, I always believe that people should use their motivation to create a new routine, not to, for one thing to end all. So for example, instead of saying, I don't know, it's a new year resolution, I want to go a month to the gym every other day, I would rather uh, prefer the person saying, I'm going to every morning, do half an hour walk into work, into work because on one there's going to be an end and with certain benefits that would last for a certain time with a second one and um, there may be not as many benefits but these can actually keep improving and it's a stable long-lasting uh, change so generally obviously we need to see some people have lots of motivation and I tend to bring the example of, you know, a few clients I had in the past and say, my wife sent me with that kind of tone of voice. And you think, okay, well, that's not looking good, is it? Because as far as that, that maybe the person as an assumption just has very little motivation to do anything. It's just there because someone sent the person there. And on the opposite end of the scale, you have people say, whatever you say i'll do it and they will do it so you have two very different budget in their motivation that you have to administer so the the scope of the study would have been to try to ask people to make a change invest in their motivation in all of these five elements or really focusing on one or two there are some substantial setup uh, problems and method problem and design of the study because when someone makes a change can change other things that involves you know some of the other aspects and it's really difficult to control certain aspects so we, we, we are scratching our head a bit uh, right now uh, but we need to see however what it seems to be even in my research project the one that you know I've done is unpublished but I treated it as if it would be published um, I wanted to observe what are the things that actually affect the physiology, including you know, fasting glucose level, heart rate variability, breathing rate, whatever that may be. And when people get in each of the five aspects of life um, around okay, so they, they get a minimum of a good degree of, of functioning or status, these are the people that seem to have the, the, the longest lasting effects of that specific change. So what I'm trying to say is that 
I at times see people with an absolutely impeccable diet and yet the sleep is out, the chronobiology is out, the life load is out and so on. Or people that exercise to exhaustion with a bad diet, a poor sleep and, and so on. So rather than focusing on one thing and invest all the motivation, which eventually is likely to run out, I would then prefer to perhaps spread that motivation across different fields in order to try to make the body a little bit more uh, balanced in a way. Of course, if someone has more of a problem with one, it makes logical sense to perhaps invest more of that into one. And what I've noticed is that um, the, the amount of time, oh yes, I know my sleep is bad, but what should I eat? And I think, no, is exactly because your sleep is bad that maybe the food has even more of a negative impact when it wouldn't maybe have such a negative impact if your sleep would be good. And which, which is, is quite difficult for me being a nutritionist because I'm not qualified in the other areas. And, you know, I can stretch it to say when to eat the, or the eating late would affect the sleep and the entrain your body clock, which this has been shown to potentially have these effects. So it's quite, it's quite, I think it's quite um, difficult. However, as a general thinking, I, I, I've noticed that when people reach a certain degree of health uh, and balance, in all the aspects of the lives, um, things tend to get better quite quickly. Now, for your audience, I would say that obviously food is important, but perhaps the first thing that would jump into mind to consider during an, an evaluation would be the body clock, the life load, and the sleep. These would be probably the three things that I would want to definitely pay attention to investigate if it's something if 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 there is something that can be done and have some some kind of um evaluation so i've seen people on bad diets and they didn't get adrenally exhausted um as you would as people would call it um i've seen people doing exercise at a certain degree and they were okay unless they went way over so post viral fatigue syndromes for example or um low immune defenses with a massive stress load um so you have all of these different scenarios but generally speaking i saw people that had sleep deprivation for a really long year or sleep quality that was poor for a very long time uh dn trains circadian clocks these and obviously an excessive life load but is how they perceived their life load, not just the fact that they didn't rest. So how big of an imp so it's really interesting because the in a recent uh, in a recent study uh, they were classifying the effect on certain aspects of life as people that get stressed a lot, people that have a kind of hedonic response so for example when they stress the stress has an impact but then what is the reward system that they want to put in place for that stress reaction so for example when people are stressed they change the the, 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 the food preferences trying to go from towards more palatable food that normally means more refined food, not exactly healthy foods. Now, and I experienced that because I'm a nutritionist, I'm really happy with my diet, but when I went through La summer, for example, a heavy load of stress response, which wasn't necessarily all bad, but it was a really heavy load, I started to feel like eating very different things. And you think, hang on a minute, I've been eating like this for years and I, I'm not bored of it. I actually like it. So what the heck is that? And you can start to see that the, 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 even the food preferences within palatability can be a factor in that. And then obviously you have higher loads, your AHPA axis is going mental. And also then now we don't support 
the body as well because our food preference is changing our risk taking is changing so we generate potentially more stress so it's not as simple as saying you have too much stress it's also how the stress is impacting on the person how the positive stress also happy life load is still a load that has to be added um, so I, I find dramatically interesting to actually see the effects that uh, diet, physical activity, life load, sleep, and chronobiology has in my, in my small research project. Yeah, it's quite amazing. Number one, I love the analogy of a, hey, we're going to give you a certain amount of investment uh, in your body. Um, and that's the, what you call motivation. I would just say, hey, like, you know, the, my, my simpler mind would look at it as you have a certain amount of uh, dollars to invest in your health. And, and we would rather you yeah. spread it out over even not even the five light uh, basics, but even just the body clock, the life load and the sleep. And, um, and, yeah. and but what I really love about what you just mentioned there, Alessandro, is your awareness of your, your own uh, physiology, that when you had a increase in life load, whether it was you stress, good stress, or, or de-stress, bad stress, um, it impacted in, in a way your A, HPA axis um, from in, in terms of, um, I, I feel like I have behavioral traits that are changing, based on my life load. Yeah. And if someone is not aware of that, because awareness is the key, if someone is not aware of that, they'll go down a slippery slope of moving away from uh, ideal HRV, um, glucose tolerance, and then it becomes a vicious cycle. So what did you do just personally when that happened? You just figured, okay, knock it off, eat the food that you're supposed to eat, or what, what happened there? Uh, uh, it was really interesting because I, I, I actually, um, yes, you can counteract the effects of stress response on food preferences and what have you, but I don't find that that's sustainable on the long term. Um, so I try to tackle the why I was doing that rather than the fact of what I was doing. Um, so the, despite the, the diet wasn't as optimal as normally is, I, I, I tried to, so I started to do some um, more breaks, more meditation and trying to reframe some of the problems that were created. Um, so that seems to have once again more of a long lasting effect rather than every day for the person that goes into a shop and is, is having to choose something to eat and everything is on display and inevitably the, there is a strong likelihood that the things when someone is stressed are going to have more associate, association with something that is more palatable. doesn't necessarily mean bad because there are obviously healthy foods that are palatable, but it, this doesn't seem to last very long. So uh, instead of asking people to constantly, every day, invest in motivation to try to eat good food, maybe part of that motivation, part of that motivational budget, as I call it, maybe go in trying to resolve how they perceive the stress and what can they do to implement something because then the food choices may be easier. Um, this is all brilliant hypothetically, yeah, but obviously everyone is different and, and some people can live years by being high stress. I have a colleague that, you know, that is a very high stress load and the person doesn't seem to have any problems whatsoever in being in a, you know, in, in keeping an absolutely uh, fantastic diet, which to, to the person's account is what keeps the person's healthy because the person is all working shift and, and et cetera, et cetera. And you think, right, okay, see the point. How many people you find? Because most people would, would probably give in after a while. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think that I tend to use the motivation budget quite, quite regularly, if not all the time, and actually see what the person is. 
athletes completely different ball game normally you say it they do it because they are in nature very highly motivated people food sleep all of these things do impact positively their performance so therefore i i've, I've got it easy because as long as I can find the application for that specific individual, um, looking at the research for perhaps the application of the sports that individual is doing, then I can, you know, I can give, um, uh, you know, suggestions to do things in, in a certain manner. More often than not, if the person's perception is out, so if the life load is um, pretty hefty, then sleep is affected, chronic biology is affected, diet is affected, and exercise is affected. So that seems to be, I'm not saying that is the thing, but I'm saying that definitely is one to look at, especially in, in AHPA access dysfunction, because it is the easiest trigger of more hyperarousal activation of that system. Yeah, so, so the moral of the story is really protect your perception um, of, of how, or be aware of the importance of perception uh, on, your, on your vicious cycle of, of how that will impact your body's fight or flight mechanism and ultimately your energy levels. Let's say we get into data tracking because that's what I teach a lot of the people that I work with. Let's look at our HRV, which is your heart rate variability, the amount of beats between the beats or the cadence. And if it's wide, then we know we have a good parasympathetic adaptable response. If it's very tightly controlled, it's sympathetic, it's going to be yeah. lower. Um, and then we track also things like glucose or ketones um, and or we track uh, the other thing I want, which I wanted to ask you was, um, adding in the, um, the self-reported data. So how are you integrating yeah. that, the self-reported data? Like, hey, I'm testing these different things, but they may not mean anything to me unless I get some feedback on what's going on with your life and if it's making a difference or not. So how do you integrate that, Alessandro, into the people that you work with to make useful information of the data? Sure. Um, now, I tend to use mainly, obviously, a few apps, uh, which I have the coach version, so I can remotely check things. Um, in one in particular, I'm using for HIV, it's called HIV for training, um, where four is the number four, so HRV four, the number training, or one word, um, where they can actually add um their own personal notes and they and, and three of these fields are numerical so that is so for example the question can be personalized to the individuals um and they can then choose whatever or we can then together choose whatever they want to you know track for example in some individuals i i mentioned to transform the time in categorical data by giving a window. So last time of eating the day, not the, the day before, um, if I find someone with a particularly low nighttime HIV and increased fasting glucose where everything else is pretty good, then I'm starting to look at the timing of eating or the time that they get stressed. And I ask them to either estimate it, zero to 10, uh, with 10 is the lowest, oh, sorry, uh, zero is the lowest, 10 is the highest, or and per numerical data equivalent to a time of eating of the day. So for example, when is likely that you are gonna eat the soonest? Uh, and someone will say, I don't know, five o'clock. And when is the latest? And they would say, I don't know, 10 o'clock. And so between one uh, hour gap, that will be one numerical increment. So that will be scored zero to five. So the zero equals the five and uh, the one equals the six and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, people can do whatever they want um, or they can put the numerical time data into a, an Excel spreadsheet. I try to make it as easy as I possibly can. So in that specific app, they can actually generate um, correlation graphs 
and trends, which is really, really handy because this is one of the uh, one of the times where I started to actually see a correlation between fasting glucose, heart rate variability, um, and etc. in relation to the last time of eating. The later someone would eat, the more likely is the, 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 the possibility that the following day variables are not optimal or definitely not to the mean that would normally have when they do not eat that late or, or etc. So um, that has been very insightful. Uh, because with, with, with the tracking, you can observe certain things. Then you can then decide to do a snapshot reading or to do a, an ongoing reading. So I have a medical, um, a two-site sensor medical device for measuring ongoingly heart availability that does have no Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. You just, uh, it's something that records it and then you plug into the computer uh, and then it can work out all the graphs and, and, and so on. And that was the biggest awakening I had in relation to the amygdala, HPA axis thing, uh, purely because I started to see people's reaction that were at times diametrically opposite. Um, I keep bringing this example um, when I lecture. So there was a gentleman that every other day, every three days, there was a really good, deep parasympathetic activation. And I said, um, what, so there is an online diary, but the equivalent was empty. So the equivalent time slot was actually empty. And I said, okay, well, this is really important. What did you do then? And he didn't want to say. And I thought, oops, okay, so maybe something that I don't need that information will be too much information, I don't know. And, uh, and I said, okay, well, um, ideally, as long as it's legal, <laughs> um, you should be doing more of that. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, I'm washing my car. I went, right. So that proved to me there was a big kind of awakening call because I said, when I'm washing my car, he said and added, I'm just literally in my zone. So I find car detail and I'm just, it's just me. There is no, it is purposeless, is mindless. I just do it and I love it. I said, okay, so that, if that is your recovery time, then do whatever you need. For me is breathing and practicing my forms really, really, really slowly uh, in the woods I have in front of my house. So it doesn't, could be a mindless walk. It doesn't matter what it is, but as long as there is that balance between the two. So this is where an ongoing tracking can be uh, perhaps very, very useful uh, because the snapshot in the day tells you what stage you are at, but then you have to make assumption on what has generated. We kind of know what are the big ones, but if you're struggling in knowing that, then perhaps you may want to consider a more uh, targeted ongoing um, evaluation, if that makes sense. Makes total sense. And um, <clears throat> to, to echo what you just finished talking about when you have a certain currency of motivation and you said you'd rather see them invest that in something that's uh, baseline and improvable, um, that, that, that has a ability to continue to improve versus I'm just going to go to the gym and it's going to have an end uh, uh, end value. Um, but what I, what I would sort of uh, elaborate on that, Alessandro, and I would say um, for, for those that, um, uh, that have a certain amount of currency to invest in, in energy in their body so that they're improving their stress response, we've found that what you move towards versus what you move away from. So for example, People that are exhausted and burnt out and stressed are so micromanaging the things that aren't working in their life. I, I can't do this. I can't yeah. do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. And then you ask them, okay, if I had a magic wand, what would it be that you would do in your life? And inevitably, the answers are, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do that. And, and I didn't ask you that. I asked you, what would it be that you would do, right? What would it be that you would do? Not what you would move away from, but what would you move towards? And they look at me like, oh, yeah. I, I never thought about that. And I was like, well, that's part of the problem is we don't have an energy or frequency um, or, or ideal area to gravitate towards versus away from. And I think that echoes with yeah. what you're saying. 
saying in terms of the currency of, of doing what you love and giving yourself permission that this is actually going to ultimately, number one, move me away from the negative, but number two, increase my HRV, increase my parasympathetic activity, and ultimately have a profound impact on my health. Would, would, you, would you agree with that? Um, absolutely. I, I, I started you know, counseling and psychotherapy only at certificate levels. So it was only for a couple of years, um, a very low level. But that was one of the things that really struck me is that sometimes, especially in behavioral stuff, um, people don't seem to have a goal. People don't seem to um, even know what would, in a way, make them happy, as in, or made them, you know, made them joyful or give them pleasure or what is that they want to do exactly as you just said um and, and this has happened with my my literally very last patient um he he's uh, he's into journalism and heavy uh just the load on on, on journalism you know on it, it's it's quite quite strong uh reporters that kind of stuff and uh he just he just wouldn't know what to do if he would have spare time because most of the day he spent arguing, researching, firefighting, everything that is around him pretty much. So um, to the point that I, <laughs> you know, strongly suggested to do an ongoing measuring uh, uh, thing. And, and the, the other thing to still also support what you just mentioned is that it, it, if people don't get that vision, uh, and that brings me back to things like New Year's resolution. Well, even science seems to have proven that they just don't really work well. So ideally, we want to um, we want to make sure that you have a vision rather than a New Year resolution. Because I don't know many people that were able even to do half of them, if I just recall what we kind of what we talk about so um ideally you want to make a vision and leave that at the back of your head oh. i'm sure you can hear my dogs yeah that's fine they're happy <laughs> yeah no i think there is someone at the door <laughs> oh okay um, right. just give me one second i'm so okay, sorry don't worry. yeah that's okay <laughs> Yeah. Would you give me one minute? Sure, no problem. Yep. Okay, it's not going to go away. No worries. So, so yeah, so I think we were talking about um what were we talking what was our last thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, we mentioned um about having a vision. Right. So, okay, right. Uh, and the difference between New Year's resolution, because you mentioned uh, that when you ask people, if I have the magic wand, what would you do? And they keep saying to you, well, they wouldn't do. Um, right. And that's why when I see that situation, I tend to know that improving the diet may keep them at bay with their health. Uh, but at times, if not most of the times, may not be enough for them to jump over a certain threshold to then feel healthy. So this is highly, you know, it's highly uh, personalized to each individuals. And, you know, in here we are generalizing. And on top of that, my opinion may be skewed due to the subset population that is my patient. So, um, but absolutely, when I see that the stress is very high, most of the times I'm, I'm, I'm micromanaging uh, the health with the diet, but unless they take, which is the reason why I then uh, send out a kit to measure heart rate variability, uh, stress and parasympathetic response, so sympathetic and parasympathetic balance during a day because it shows in a graph very, very, very well and they can see, so right, okay, so you're not, starting a parasympathetic uh, state until three o'clock in the morning and you wake up at six. So instead of having six, seven, eight hours of recovery, you, you spend half of the first 
time of your night um, in, in a sympathetic activation. So one, you're not recovering, two, your body's still spending things or trying to get to that point. Um, so going from four pieces of broccoli to six, it is not going to cut it. So, you know, it's, it, it, there has to be that element, um, which made me more and more interested in looking at all the different things within the environment, including that. Although I'm not qualified for that, so I can only mention or refer uh, people to practitioners. So that's, you know, my, my, my studying in psychology, NLP, and et cetera, it, it was more at a little bit more of informative level. Um, because I wanted to have an understanding um, rather than be able to practice as such. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I, I wouldn't sell yourself short, Alessandro. It's the, it's the uh, awareness of pointing it out to your clientele that your life load and your perception of your life load and, yes. hey, look at your HRV. Do the, when they actually Precisely. look at it, and they see it, it's like, oh, wow, you're not full of BS. This is something that is impacting me. And the sexy methylation supplement protocol, blah, 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 comes down to more of the basics. And I think that's a summary of what we've talked about is as much as you're a scientist and you know about all these different variables, it's really simplicity of the basics right it's the simplicity of your perception um, your your movement are you moving is the food that you're eating does it look like food that grandma Nona would know right and and would be growing on the tree you know in the in the in the areas um, and uh, are, as well are you are you sleeping are you protecting your circadian rhythm are you having good sleep wake cycles are you are you know all these things so as far as um, in, in, in closing, um, I know you've talked, uh, I went on your website and you have a lot more new information on there. It's probably, we'll, we'll save for part three in about a year from now. Um, but you do have some new tools on there, which looked really cool to me. And like the Mito calculator app and energetic estimation. Um, what, what kind of direction is that going? And I'm just curious. Oh, brilliant. Uh, yeah, so um, maybe next time we need to cover that at the start. <laughs> yeah, right. um, I, I, I have been researching, well, I have researched um, ketogenic applications, both in sport performance and general population, disease population, and uh, trying to really evaluate when is applicable, when brings good results, when brings detrimental results, and so the, 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 the whole amplitude of the thing. Um, we, we published a paper on ketogenic diet and HIT, um, and it it was it was a great experience because uh, the 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 study showed a no detrimental effect of the ketogenic diet over four weeks period, um, but it was a strong standard variation standard deviation and variations between the subjects. So despite the mean average show no drop in performance, one that does not mean that is good, because at the end of the day it was equal. Uh, some systems got more efficient, whereas some others got less efficient. And, but the, 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 for some individuals, it wasn't great, clearly. Um, so that, that one raises the question of intra-individual, intra-group individual uh, potential for application. So some people may not, even in the right context maybe for them would not be right whereas some others even in the wrong context for them could be right giving it there long enough would it work given that three weeks was enough was not enough um so it's kind of it, it opens up your eyes that i think there is a methodology within the application of any uh, dietary regimen and context that is highly dependent to the individual but also context dependent so the reason why we, 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 we looked at the mitocalculator was because we started to realize that 
um, some of the normal caloric calculation wouldn't add up. And I was having a, a, a chat long time ago with uh, Dr. Tommy Wood for Nordish Balance Thrive. And um, we were kind of bouncing ideas and in, in, in my business partner, Waco Jaros, was, was um, at the start, uh, I, he all started because I said, dude, this is my data for exercise and this is my diet. I have not lost any weight. I haven't done anything else. Been on, on a testing ketogenic diet now for a long time. I do both HIT and endurance, um, um, low effort, prolonged time type of, and the data doesn't add up. I should have been dead or a stone lighter than now if I would have gone with the calculation. I always eat at libitum. Proteins were matched always for the type of sports and effort I was doing. And so we, we started to investigate that it could potentially be a, 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 an error, a, a bigger error in the caloric estimation using normal general population data, which is what we have, or you know, caloric databases or the, 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 the usual you know, uh, um, indirect calorimetry for estimation. So we started to see, he went on and even spoke to um, Dr. Kevin Hall, which had the kind of metabolic study um, that I guess virtually every single uh, keto supporter has tried to uh, <laughs> have a go at it. Um, but we, we tend to see that there is a 10 to 20% um, overestimation of the energetic intake with calories calculations in people that are on a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. So you said, okay, well, how are we going to estimate the energy? So we came out with the mitocalc, which uh, is still, I think now is on the, um, is on iTunes, uh, is not on Android yet. Um, it seems to have a few little hiccups on that, um, but it is on Apple devices and people can download it. I don't even know the price uh, of that, and if, it's, if there is a price. Um, I'm terrible with that. But they can go onto the MyTalkAlk or can go on my website and use the web app, and that's totally fine. So basically all we do, we're trying to estimate the number of carbons and given an estimation of the ketogenic diet, um, and the type of that we involve cellular entropy, enthalpy, so some, some really, in my view, very groovy stuff. Um, so people can look at maintenance and there is a, a, a constant 10, 15, 20% difference between normal caloric calculation estimated on activity, weight and age um, and our mitocalc for people that are on a low carbohydrate diet. As soon as the carbohydrate raise, then that the, the the caloric estimation seems to match. So, but there are other aspects of that. Um, we we came up. I I came up with a with an index using heart rate variability divided by the square of the glucose, uh, in order to try to have uh, and have a podcast. I think on my website with a little bit more explanation of that. But in a nutshell, to try to estimate some kind of metabolic state, metabolic flexibility, um, because um, if everything is controlled, so they are on a good diet, there are no excess in energetic surplus, there are no excess in refined food, carbohydrates, and etc. cetera, um, fasting glucose can be used also as a marker for potential further investigation of chronic low-grade inflammatory response. And which brings me back to the point I made earlier that sometimes I saw people that, and, and this is actually quite often the subset population I see. So people come to me uh, and they have, uh, you know, good diet, they exercise, maybe on the too much side, which is, was the big hint for me. Uh, sleep is okay. So generally speaking, they shouldn't feel as they should. And there is something else going on. And in virtually all of them, I've noticed that their fasting glucose levels were actually risen going to the worst with two Olympians, uh, one current, one bean, that the, the glucose was in, in, in probably, as a rough estimate, half of the time, 50%, um, was in just pre-diabetic range. And you think this doesn't add up. It's not that you're not doing enough exercise. 
you don't seem to be doing too much exercise. Um, so what's going on in here? And then we, we, we were able to find a few, a uh, few little hiccups. And that led me to uh, try to understand what mechanisms are involved from the immune system that are involved in chronic inflammatory response and would potentially affect fasting glucose and insulin resistance. And that was, that is what we are researching. Um, well, not exactly right now. I stopped last year and just about to restart again. Um, but things like, for example, the, uh, the glycolytic preference of our immune system, the inflammation and inflammatory components and chemicals that would diminish our insulin sensitivity um, with consequent raising uh, fasting glucose, a potential uh, increased gluconeogenesis because in trying to feed potentially the, um, the immune system and that response, um, so th this, yeah, this is the stuff that we have been um, involved uh, in more uh, in more recent times. It's it's awesome. I know because last time, you know, you mentioned that as a exercise physiologist, nutritionist, you've been studying glucose for so long, and and when we talked about the term adrenal fatigue coming full circle, now um, you mentioned just with glu glucose alone, right? With um, glucose alone, yeah. the mechanisms that affect that inflammation, all your inflammatory cytokines, insulin, glucagon, um, isocaloric, hypocaloric, hypercaloric, all these things that impact just glucose alone. But what's really great now is that um, you, you, we can understand that um, glucose is not just, and this is where the hairs on the neck stand up, glucose is just not about getting ketogenic or controlling your carbs. It's looking deeper and understanding right. all of the inflammatory response, which brings us right back to the AHPA axis and how the perceived life load impacts that also. So, you know, so if I guess if I'm a yeah. listener one more time, just before we, we end here, and I respect your time, Alessandro, is... Um, okay, I just, now I'm overwhelmed. Just, just fed me with a, a fire hose. It's coming through my ears and my eyes. And what do I make of all of this? So what would you do once again to ease the concern of, okay, I, I understand the basics in terms of eat uh, something that looks like you would find in nature. Um, but like now with yeah. a year later, what would be that next action step that you would also tell the listener who is still not quite there um, is still dealing with lots of uh, fatigue. Um, they may have one good day, one bad day. And that's what I get a lot of. Hey, today I could do a million things. Tomorrow I can't even blink my eyes. So what would be a nice take home for them commensurating what we've talked about? Yeah, uh, my reply to someone that said that, um, actually, interestingly enough, was uh, um, well, first of all, don't try to do the million things. So you may able to be open your eyes the following day kind of thing. Right, so basically right. try, to, uh, try to spread that impact. It, it just reminded me of my, my, um, uh, one of my friend's dog and, 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 and it was constantly kind of uh, whacked out and, and an injection came and then for three days you couldn't keep him still even nighttime and then boom, we'll crash again and then another injection. You think, okay, that seems to have some interesting points that we can apply to humans. So, because, so try to have a routine where an, an attitude that allows the person to uh, kind of ponder. Uh, so basically, uh, two things. I use something called the 80-20 rule. What is the change that's going to give you the biggest effect? What, what is the 20% investment that will give you the vast majority of the result? And as I mentioned earlier, often in my subset population as a patient is not four pieces of broccoli. They may help, may support. We can go from four to six, but it's not, it's not going to be the 80-20 rule. It can help and support but it's not going to be the thing. So try to find the 80 20 rule that works for you. If your stress response is completely out, if you're firefighting all day, just address that. If your sleep is a disaster, either because of the stress, or is the sleep causing the stress, which we still do not know, um, then try to break that vicious cycle. 
Um, as far as diet, I'd say keep it simple. Uh, keep it really simple to start with. Match your protein for your for for the activity that you do, for your height, weight, and whatever you. In there are ample amount of ways of determining that, but generally speaking, three meals a day, fistful size. That 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 gets you a decent start, right? Um, have ample amount of vegetables. I wouldn't unless you're working with someone. Don't I wouldn't go on any. Um, heavily motivational taxing diets. Um, the, is always, once again, anything, even for ketogenic diet or, 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 or straight low carb diet, I, I would want to work with someone that know what they're doing. Uh, especially they know when to apply it and especially know when not to apply it. Um, that is a big thing. Um, try to have an understanding of energy match. So this is how much you spend. Um, trying to evaluate that. That really simple, you know, nice and simple. Um, the vegetables, the one that they look like, you know, should be in nature or the food that that still stands and is still what I say uh, most of the times. So basically what I'm trying to say is get the basics right. If that is not enough, then work with someone more specifically on today's points that can be beneficial to you because of a very specific personal situation. Um, as far as physical activity, I'd say move. Don't overdo it, don't underdo it. If you can try to uh, stimulate certain processes, um, uh, would be great, like autophagy, as far as doing some perhaps simple, fasted, brisk uh, physical activity. Um, as long as it's not perceived as a stress response, once again, uh, by my correlation, uh, there wasn't really anything that jumped out so substantially compared to other form of exercise. It's just the fact that if you do regular physical activity, that seems to keep you out of trouble all the time. And then you can go and choose whatever, um, you know, cycling, CrossFit, weight training. They, they, they have different benefits, but... As far as general health, I personally try to choose something that you enjoy. So I enjoy my sport. When I'm not training in that sport, I go into the woods and either do a jog or go for a bike ride or so something I enjoy because then I get two things in once, right? Right, right. Um, really look after your sleep. Really look after your sleep. Get a routine. Get regular. Same day. Same day. Same time. Same waking up time, so same retiring time, um, just create the right environment for the body to recover. Uh, that's the best possible gift you can give to, 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 in a way, your health to a certain extent, because if you don't create that space, uh, I have people that sleep with pets, yes, but you know, I love it and et cetera, et cetera. I said, yeah, but it still wakes you up three, four times a night. I don't think that is great uh, for your sleep. And then, I look at the HIV data, okay, shall I guess, looking at this graph all the time, it takes you an hour for you to get back into a parasympathetic state. That's three to four hours you lose out of seven or eight. So it's not, it's not doing your recovery any favor. It may do your emotional aspect some favors, but so that's that. Um, chronobiology, just be careful in, in, in bringing, in reining in all the things that affect your detoxification at night. So um, eat, sleep, um, and so basically physical activity, eating, and stress response, try to put a cap at certain time that you say after that, you don't want to know about work, you don't want to know about certain things, you don't want to watch certain type of horror, violent film if you are affected by it, don't watch the news after a certain time, electronics away for the master clock. So just really try to get the simple stuff, the basic simple stuff, which isn't easy to do, but try to get it absolutely spot on in the five elements that we mentioned. Once that is done and assessed and likely you are feeling dramatically better 
dramatically better. Then if there is something left over, maybe you want to go into more specific by working with someone. That, that's what I tend to suggest. Yeah, it's, it's really brilliant. And as mu- it's interesting because it's a paradox between as much as you learn and as much as you're aware of what you're not aware of and you keep becoming more aware of what you're not aware of and, and so forth and so on, it really, the more things change, the more they stay as- the same in terms of the basics, right? In terms of what we recommend. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, what I would like to say, though, is thank you for all that you do, because I do think it's a, like I said last time, a, a paradigm shift in the way that healthcare is practiced, not sickness care, and that we can look at these uh, metrics and data track for, like you've said, in terms of observe, measure, cause, effect, and then tinker. And, and really, that comes down to yeah. Uh, understanding these five basics from your your perceived life load, your circadian rhythm, your movement, your dietary, and your sleep. And 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 if yeah. you can get those basics in and keep a regular schedule and, and eat food that um, nature looks like, and not even that for that matter, Alessandro. But if we have 2.5 million years that our our genetics or our, our at least our the way our body works not just with the food that we see in nature, but with our activities of daily living. I mean, in terms of hunter-gatherer, sleep-wake, electronics, synthetics, chemicals, processing, so forth and so on, that that wasn't engineered as part of our biology. So keep it like you, you know, the modern day caveman, I guess, in terms of being able to keep your body as basic as possible. Well, and you mentioned your website. So um, uh, our listeners would would love to be able to see your resources, uh, the micro calculator, the energetic estimations and the uh, videos that you have. How do they get there, Alessandro? Um, yeah, sure. It's really simple. It's just my full name, alessandroferretti.co.uk. And uh, they just, just log on and have a browse and have a laugh. Uh, it's just really, really simple. That There is nothing to buy or nothing to sell. So it's, it's just, um, you know, they can go in and, and see what I've been up to. Yeah, and then one more time, too, for spelling us, uh, our, our North Americans that don't know how to spell Alessandro Ferretti. How do, how do we spell that? So, um, is A L E double S A N D R O, and then the surname is F E double R E double T I. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So, I, I appreciate everything, Alessandro. Um, I, I, I will probably watch this maybe four or five times myself just to get more information. That's how I work. Um, and um, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I hope the listeners get a lot of benefit out of this. And listen, I, I'd love to keep the, the, the saga of the story going in a, in a year from now and hear what new good information you have. And uh, I, I, I wish you all the best in your journey along the way as well. So thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure both times, of course. All right, great. Thank you so much, Alessandro. You're very welcome, good man. So I hope that was, you know, 